Welcome to Africa on Arts TV. Each week, Africa will highlight news, information, and views to reveal the true color of the continent. Stay with us. Salim Amin is a co-founder and chairman of Africa 24 Media and also a co-founder for Camera Pix. Salim Amin have sat down with Africa for an interview. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's good to be here, buddy. Welcome. Thank you. How is that treating you? Oh, Addis has been good so far. It's always good. My favorite city, so it's always good. What is like growing up in the shadow of your father? Well, it's an interesting life, put it that way. It's not been uh, boring. Um, it was a big shadow and, uh, you know, but I've always used his memory as an inspiration for what I do and uh, to, to drive me harder, to, to motivate me. So it's been actually, you know, it's been wonderful kind of growing up with him and having him kind of looking over my shoulder wherever I am. And especially coming to Ethiopia is always, uh, it always brings back a lot of memories. How did you deal with your youngest time when he was absent going for work two or three months? Well, I, you know, I had a good time because he wouldn't let me party and stuff when, I, when he was around. So when he wasn't around, I took full advantage of, of that. Um, but no, I, you know, I just, since I was born, that was, he was traveling, he was always away. So for me, it was normal. It wasn't like I'd known him any differently. So him being away on assignment was a normal, normal thing for me when I was growing up. So, uh, you know, yeah, I missed him, but, uh, but I just knew that was part of his, his work. And I realized very early on that, um, you know, his priority was his work. That was his first priority. The family came uh, a, a distant uh, second. What is your greatest memory of him? Uh, covering the East African Safari Rally. Those were, those were the most fun times we had. There was a big um, a car rally every Easter that used to happen uh, around East Africa. And since I was about eight years old, I used to go out with him to, to cover that. So we would spend four days on the road and, um, you know, photographing and filming these uh, rally cars. Um, so that was the most time I ever spent with him and time I spent with him on the road. And yeah, it was, those were the best growing up memories for me. Um, your father, he has been the voice for Ethiopia by covering the famine at that time. And um, I also read he was the last one to take the picture of the emperor head of the state. Tell us his connection with Ethiopia. Well, you know, he'd been traveling here and been coming here for, for many, many years. I think his uh, um, friendship, if you can call it, with the emperor was something that, that he cherished and, and uh, you know, he g gave him access to the emperor. Uh, and he was there for a lot of the big moments uh, in the emperor's life. And then obviously when um, the revolution happened and, and the Derg regime came in and Mengistu came in, he still had very good contacts here and you know utilized those and covered um, uh, you know sort of the, the things that Mengistu was getting up to and what the Derg was doing um, and then his biggest story was obviously the famine of 1984 up in in Koram and Mekele and Alamata and um, you know that that took his career to a very different level but also um, changed his life changed him personally a huge amount because of what he saw uh, on the plains of Coram and, and, and the and the um, and the famine and the and the people that were dying from starvation. It changed his complete career. Up to that point, he saw um, every story was news story was just another story. He would cover it. There would be no emotion involved, and he would move on to the next big story. But the famine was very different for him and it became something that he was determined not to let people forget about it, not to let it happen again. So he kept coming back, you know, God, hundreds of times to make sure that the story didn't go away. Um, and then, you know, losing his arm uh, in the explosion in 1991, uh, uh, here, you know, a few, few kilometers from here, um, was again a life-changing moment for him, uh, having to adapt to shooting with one arm, uh, even though he had a, a very uh, advanced 
bionic arm that was uh, allowed him to do a lot of things but it changed his life considerably and then eventually um, dying on an Ethiopian Airlines plane so th this country was very connected to him he had some sort of special connection with Ethiopia he loved this country he loved the people um, and you know he, he spent uh, you know not just the big news stories but in between those stories he published half a dozen books on Ethiopia showing the, the, the sort of the beauty of the place, the country, the people, the culture. Uh, I don't know how many times he covered Timcat and Epiphany and, and Easter and, and uh, um, uh, Mescal and all of the, the different you know, ceremonies that happened. Um, he went from Lalibela to Gondar to Aksum to Harar. I think he covered this country more than most Ethiopians have, have actually seen. Um, photographing the beauty and the people and the and the culture that he was so fascinated by. Very good. Uh, keep listening. You use Amharic terms. How would you write Amharic? Non-existent. <laughs> Completely non. It's one of the hardest languages that I think are are out there. So I'm uh, just salam and amasaganalam and that's about it. You know, <laughs> and that's all I know. <laughs> and ishi. Everyone knows Ishi. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, sadly, I, I would love to be fluent in Amharic, but um, hasn't happened yet. Great. At the age of 19, where most of us playing and doing other stuff, your father had cancer. Mm -hmm. Camera picture. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. How is the company operating now? Well, it's operating. I mean, it's tough times. We've had to re. Um, reformat the company many many times uh, since you know he passed on uh, the the landscape the media landscape has changed tremendously to when he was operating uh, at the time when he was uh, uh, doing his news stories and covering the continent none of the big broadcasters like BBC or or uh, CNN or Reuters or um, Associated Press or people like that agencies had people on the continent so they relied on him to to get the news. So he had a, almost a monopoly in terms of news gathering and news coverage. Um, now every major broadcaster on the continent has got bureaus across the continent. Uh, news doesn't make money anymore. It's not lucrative to, to cover it. So we changed the company to do more long form content, more documentaries, more features. Um, one of the, the, I think one of the, the best things he ever did was create a program called Africa Journal um, back in 1993. And Africa Journal was the first magazine show on the continent. So showcasing the successes of Africa. So musicians, art, um, uh, entrepreneurs, techies, showcasing some of the, the beauty of the continent and the talent on the continent. And for me, that was, I think, the best thing that he ever produced because it showed a completely different side to the continent. And it's still running. Africa Journal still goes on, um, you know, almost 30 years, the longest running show in African history. Um, so these are some of the things that we will adapt. We, now we have so many new platforms to operate on. Uh, the internet is there, you've got all this social media. You have to adapt your content to a younger audience, an audience that has a much shorter attention span. So you have to re repurpose your content or produce it in a very different way to cater to, to a new audience. Um, you know, nobody's going to sit and watch this interview with me for the entire duration. They probably will watch little bits of it and you might have to edit and put on social media 60 second clips, but very few people will sit and watch a half hour long interview, um, which is sad, but that's just the reality of, of, of the world that we live in now. So all media companies have to adapt to, to uh, the, the changing environment now. Um, and we've just, you know, we've tried to do that sometimes successfully, sometimes not. You know, and, um, and, and yeah, business is tough at the moment. Uh, but, you know, we continue. What he left, what he left behind was this incredible archive. So we have close to three million images, um, thousands and thousands of hours of video that nobody in the world has got. So utilizing that, trying to figure out ways that we can 
repurpose and repackage that archive to be able to create new content, but also to be able to educate new generations of Africans about the history of the continent is something that I think it's, it's challenging, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and I, I find um, that the millennials don't have an understanding about the history of their countries not just Ethiopia, but anywhere on, on the continent. They don't have a history. Uh, they, they don't know the history. And without knowing your history, it's very difficult to move forward into the future. You will continue to make the same mistakes. Um, and I, so that's why I think it's really important for people to, to know their history. And we have the content and hopefully we can package it in such a way that young people will be attracted to, to learning history. Mm, that's great. Besides uh, camera picks, you found another companies, or you co-found. Uh, just highlight about those Well, I, I was part of the founding of, of Africa 24 Media, so that went on for a few years, and then I left uh, after that, uh, after a few years. So that was, um, you know, disappointing, but you know, it was it was uh, it was a challenge and it was an interesting time, but um, you know, it, it didn't uh, it didn't achieve what I had hoped it would achieve. Uh, in terms of being an agency for Africa and African content. Um, the Mohammed Amin Foundation was a training um, uh, uh, school that we set up in memory of my father. That went on for 19 years and we trained some of the finest uh, uh, journalists on the continent. And so that was hugely satisfying and we're still looking at ways that we can you know, continue to do a lot of training on the continent. Uh, it's something that I think is lacking. And uh, we have the publishing company, which does also does exceptionally well. Uh, we produce the in-flight magazine for Ethiopian Airlines for the best part of 30 years. Uh, we still do the in-flight magazine for Air Seychelles, um, for a number of other smaller African airlines. So, you know, these, these and we still publish books. Uh, I did my first book in, um, in December last year, uh, published my first coffee table book. Uh, which had augmented reality in it. So it was the first of its type that incorporated um, uh, videos inside a book. So when you put your phone on certain photos, you can watch videos uh, inside the book. And it's the first historical book uh, on Africa that's ever been done that way. So, you know, we're trying to reinvent and do different things and new things. That's interesting. If something was not like that, or if he doesn't, Follow. It's hard to imagine he not following his father's footsteps, but if he doesn't, what kind of career would he have? That's a good question. I mean, I don't think, uh, I actually have never thought about it because this is all I've been doing since I was nine or ten years old. Um, so, I, you know, I don't really have any other interests in the sense that you know, I want to be a doctor or I've had this passion to be a, a lawyer or um, an accountant or, uh, you know, a rally driver or a pilot or something like that. I've never had that kind of ambition. I always wanted to be, you know, in, in a space where I could tell stories. Uh, maybe I'd be a social media kind of, you know, uh, guru or expert or something like that. Uh, but no, I, I don't know. You know, I've been mean, uh, a bit late to be a model. You know, I mean, I had the looks and everything, but you know, the distant, it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't, uh, didn't pan out that way, you know, so, uh, you know, but it's never too late to try. Could be a football player or something like that. But um, yeah, no, th this is really one of jokes aside. <laughs> this is really what I wanted to do. <laughs> this is all I really wanted to do. That's very good. What is your greatest fear? What's my greatest fear? That's, um, I don't know, letting down the people that, that count on me and, uh, you know, and not being able to kind of, uh, uh, you know, look after the people that uh, are relying on me to look after them. Uh, family, colleagues, you know, that's, that sort of would be my greatest letdown, I think, is if, if I couldn't look after them. Um, you know, spoiling his legacy as well in, in any way would be a, a big fear. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, there's no point being scared in life. If you're scared, then, you know, there's always a solution to every problem. You already mentioned a bit about uh, the foundation that was uh, named after your father. Uh, just give us a little highlight about that and how do you see 
in your opinion, today's African journalists? What do you with them? Well, the foundation was set up, as I said before, to, to, to train young African journalists because one of, and it was actually his one of the things that he wanted to do and probably would have done had he lived long enough to, to do that. He always felt that, again, the story of Africa and the continent was being told by people coming from outside. Um, the excuse that was always given to us by international media was that our quality was not good enough. That's why they didn't use African journalists to tell the stories is because we didn't produce good enough quality. We didn't have good enough camera people, sound engineers, producers, fixers. It just wasn't good enough. Um, and he got tired of hearing about that because he was one of the best in the world and he was from this continent. So he got tired of that and he wanted to, you know, he understood that technically perhaps some of the universities or schools that teach um, technical, uh, um, the technical part of, of television making, maybe they were not that, that great. Um, so he wanted to build something that would focus on creating the best camera people, the best sound engineers, the best lighting people, um, so that there would be no excuse. When we produce something, it is on par with anything that the BBC or Al Jazeera or CNN could put out there. And that was what the foundation was set up to. And, and you know, I'm, I think we succeeded. We produced some amazing, uh, talented uh, uh, camera people, uh, technicians, and they went on to work for some of the biggest organizations in the world, not just in Africa. So, but again, the training has to change. Now there's a whole new way of telling stories that, the, you know, the, the days of having three or four man crew go into the field is long gone. Now there's one person because budgets are tight. There's one person that goes out that is supposed to write the story, shoot it themselves, take still photographs, do a radio report, blog, and, and, um, and do pieces to camera all on their own. So you have to train people in a different way to uh, cater for how, how the industry has changed. Um, social media has become a big thing, so we train mobile journalists. So every we go into TV stations and we train every member of the crew on how to tell stories on a mobile phone because they can still be using the big cameras and telling the proper stories, but they should also be posting um, content on their social media platforms because that's how you drive uh, uh, audiences to come and see the bigger things. If they're intrigued or excited by some of the things that you post on a daily basis, they'll be looking out for the main product and the main program. So it's a whole new way of communicating with young people especially. You have to be proficient in, uh, on, on social media. So that's a whole new training that we've, we've, we've tried to, to go into. Um, so these are some of the, you know, African journalists have got to adapt. Uh, we have to change the way we operate. We have to um, uh, look at how the rest of the world is moving and not get left behind and not be stuck on the traditional ways that we tell stories because it's, it's not appealing to our audiences in there who are in their teens and early 20s now. That, that sort of stuff doesn't appeal to them. Mm, that's great. It's been almost 35 years since your father took the picture of the family. And uh, we all have it our own way of remembering. And for me, it's so I can't even keep thinking how he became the last person to took the picture of the Emperor Haile Selassie and the only journalist allowed in Uganda. What do you want the public to remember about him? I want people to remember him by the, the quality of the, 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 the stories that he told. The fact that he was very often the voice and the eyes of a continent that people didn't care about. He, at a time when, when, when all that came out of Africa was, was stories of, of, of horror, of famine, of war, of genocide, um, he was covering those stories, but he covered them as an African. Um, Ethiopia was very powerful, the famine was very powerful because of the way that he filmed it. Um, the dignity of the people that were dying uh, of famine, the fact that these were people that had such a history um, and were proud people but were being used by both sides of the conflict as, as, as pawns 
uh, at that time, which took a long time for the world to realize that there was a much bigger picture than just failed drought. Um, and when, you know, when, when I came back to do the film uh, uh, Revisiting Coram, uh, 30 years after the famine, uh, to see the difference uh, at the height of another drought, uh, it, it was very clear to me that you know, famine is man-made. The majority of famine is man-made. Um, there will always be drought, there always has been drought. Um, and, and people are resilient and innovative enough to be able to, to survive those, those times. And drought doesn't have to equal famine. And Ethiopia showed that 30 years on uh, through the systems that they built after the 84 famine to make sure that at least in the northern areas there was never going to be that type of famine again even though there was drought that came every couple of years. Um, and the world is, you know, climate change is happening so we're going to see many more challenges in terms of the environment, in terms of flooding, in terms of droughts, in terms of, of extreme uh, weather conditions. So we have to adapt. And he was very good at telling those stories using people. Um, and that's what I, you know, I would like him to be remembered as a person of enormous courage who went against the odds um, to tell stories about a, a continent that he loved beyond anything else. And what he's left behind is ingrained in the history books. Um, and five million people in this country alone are alive today because of the work that he did, you know, and that's that to me is 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 the is the ultimate thing you can you can achieve as a journalist is by helping save people's lives. One last question: What do you see? What do you hope to see in the world? Well, I mean, I can say love and peace, like everybody else. Um, quotes these days, um, you know, and we'd love to have love and peace and it's wonderful, but actually I'd like to see a more enlightened young population that understands their power, understands the capability that they have, um, understands what a difference they can make, whether it's in fighting climate change, whether it's in fighting ignorance and racism, and, um, and a world that seems to be increasingly, um, while we're more connected, we become more disconnected, if that makes any sense. In that we, you know, young people can really help, uh, help each other and older populations understand the meaning of living together. Um, I don't think young people see other young people in terms of race or religion or color but older people seem to still have that hang up and we need to somehow make the youth understand that they have this power to change those perceptions um, also to make us see the, the the waste that we've been doing to the world in terms of climate and 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 and, ero and um, pollution and you know the, the 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 damage we've done to our planet um, so i would really hope that they would be empowered and I really hope that young journalists would help tell those stories to make people more aware of what's going on. Again, I think it's really sad that um, even though there's so much information in the world available to young people, it seems to me they know much less than they used to. They don't know about current affairs and politics uh, simply because there is too much information. So they have the ability to choose. And choice, while it's a wonderful thing in most cases in, in life, Sometimes you shouldn't be allowed to choose. You have to, you have to be told to watch the news. You have to be forced to understand what is happening in other parts of the world because that makes you a much more um, aware individual. Um, you know, young people these days, they have the choice of whether they want to watch reality TV, music videos, sport, um, fashion. They don't necessarily have to um, they don't necessarily have to know about current affairs and climate change and the effects of racism or, um, or any of the other nuclear war or things like that. They don't have to know that. And I think they should have to know that. And so somehow I, I hope that they will get more interest in news rather than just entertainment. Anything you want to say last? No, I think it's, it's wonderful to be here and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah.
No, thank you. It's great. Muslims around the world have started the holy month Ramadan. For all the Muslims around the world, Ramadan Kareem. This is for today. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can also subscribe our YouTube channel, Arts TV World. I'm your host, Betlin Baran. Till next week, stay safe.